Hey everyone, welcome back to the Track Limits podcast presented by Formula Addict. I'm your host, Swish, with my co-host, Fevin. Hey. How you doing? You look great. Thanks. Sporting some merch. And wow, <laughs> we are in a very interesting place today, Fevin. It's pretty insane. <laughs> we, have some, we'll, we have some B-roll, we'll oh. show. Williams HQ here in Grove, it is stunning. We're in a museum that I think has 40, 50 cars. 40, 50 cars? It, it's a good question. I haven't actually added them all up, but you, you'd be about there. Certainly, it's 50 years near enough That's, of yep. Williams history. So it, it'll be slightly underneath that. Not all the cars are here, but yep. yeah, you, you're in the right ballpark. Incredible. This is heaven. But yep. at the same time, we also have an incredible guest in front of us, truly a veteran in the motorsport world, an individual that was really responsible for the race strategy for Braun GP in their 2009 championship run, which was incredibly successful. He also previously was a motorsport strategy director at Mercedes Petronas F1, where he was incredibly responsible for multiple driver championships and multiple team championships. He's now the team principal at Williams with over, by the way, 100 Grand Prix victories in his entire career. James Bowles. Welcome. Well, it's very kind of you. Well well done. That's, um, I might clip that myself. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a brilliant introduction. Thank How you. are you doing? Very, very good. Thank you for, for sporting the merch. We're just, we were talking about this off camera just beforehand, but I, I also really like that sweatshirt. I think it's iconic in what it is. So brilliant choice. Yeah, thank you. I thought it was fitting. Mm, indeed. And, and Swish, more work required. More work yeah. required. I mean, the Track Limits merch is pretty comfortable, James. Right. I don't know. We might need to hook you up with some there. <laughs> There's a selection. It Excellent. might compete. Good to know. And well, well done on product placements as well. Good. Thank you. Exactly. Give me the assist there. But anyways, James, we're going to go through your entire career. It's illustrious. Q1, we're going to dive right into you know a little bit about your career in terms of what you've done so far. Um, 2023 was a great season, you know, definitely a step in the right direction. The fact that you guys were able to bounce back seventh in the Constructors' Championship overall, huge congratulations to you and the team. Can you talk us through how you willed the team from the top down to get into that result? I think first and foremost, it's never, it's never the work of one, one person or three people. It is the work of um, close to a thousand people pulling in the same direction together. So I'm fortunate. Williams, you can see it around you, has history near enough by any other team in the grid. Ferrari has, has more, but we're there, right there. Second, second best team fundamentally in the history of the sport. That tells you most of what you need to know straight away there. So it's not, it's what I would call a sleeping giant when I, when I came here. There's some facilities that are still 20 years out of date. We, ha we haven't fixed everything. But when I came here, we weren't all pointing in the same direction. And by the way, even today, as I talk to you, we're still lining ourselves up in the right direction. So the jump forward is because we're just starting to translate performance properly, not by taking any one area and getting it to work, but getting all areas working together at the same time. And, and a lot of that sort of transpired last year. The update was, was a great update. It was a good car to, to start with uh, as a foundation, uh, a step forward, but the update really brought it its own. And then from then onwards, just point score after point score came in. I think from the August break onwards, with the exception of Singapore, where we were in the points until the dying moments, unfortunately, and Suzuka, we were there pretty much in a point scoring position, a different position than Williams has been in for perhaps the last six years before then, seven years before then, I think. So um, a lot of that is the start of our journey though. As I, as I said very publicly many times over, I'm proud of us as an organization, pulling ourselves really from, from the ditch that was last. Um, I, I think even there was some some little clips I heard where, where before the season started, the team and Alex thought, oh, here we go again, why are we here? It, it, it's, it's, it's to be 10th. From a team that really the world would have predicted would be 10th to a team that was 7th and 7th by the skin of our teeth because we put focus on the future, yep. but 7th. And in terms of you know, your temperament, I think that's something everybody appreciates. The fact that even during the toughest moments, the high pressure situations, you somehow find a way to remain calm and collected. How do you do it? And what does that day-to-day -day life regiment look like for you before and after a season? So, I mean, first and foremost, um, I use data at the sort of root cause of everything that we're doing in the background of things. So once you're reliant on data, emotion is just a secondary reaction to what's going on. So that's, that's sort of, uh, I guess, how I find my grounding to a certain extent. The second is that everyone is always trying to do their utmost. There's no one here that's working in one of the most competitive sports in the world that is purposely trying to detonate what you're doing. 
that doesn't mean we're doing the right thing or pointing in the right direction, but that, that is very different to people not wanting this or being lazy or otherwise as a result of things. And, and that's not what we suffer with day to day. And so when you remember that, and then in fact, furthermore, walk around the factory and see a thousand people that were in some cases willing to sleep on the factory floor to give you everything, you realize that you have a responsibility towards that. And humans don't respond to shouting or aggression. That's not how it works. That's not how anyone is motivated. You're responding by, here's a challenge, let's go get it together at the same time. And when you sort of recall and remember all of that, it sort of brings you together quite a bit more as to actually, we all want the same thing and we all want the same thing together. So let's be a team about it. Let's not be individuals anymore. Uh, and I guess that's part of the grounding to it. Um, the second is I'm, I'm just quite a, I'm a hyper competitive. So there are moments where I'm frustrated at myself mm -hmm. for not performing at the highest level. Um, but as long as everyone around me is on the same journey of competitiveness, then you're aligned with peers like no other place you can be in the world. Um, I'm always generally, apart from that competitive nature bit, um, calm as an individual. And, and in many regards, that's also a weakness. So a lot of people show you emotional response when things are great and when they're not. And, and I, I don't have that same breadth, let's say, in normal day-to-day -day life, I would say. This is an opinion now, in fact, more than anything else. But um, that creates a strength and a weakness. Um, but the strength that comes out of it is obviously that irrespective of the amount of pressure you pile on your shoulders, you can still stand tall and provide direction to everyone else. And that's my job uh, in all of this. As I said at the very beginning of this, it's not the work of one human being, it's the work of a thousand. And my job is to line the thousand up that will point in the right way. Yeah, I guess building on what you said earlier, was, was there any particular, like a specific challenge that you faced throughout the first year, your first year as team principal that you can kind of think of and reflect on and maybe talk us through how you overcame it as a team, but also as an as a team leader. This is turning into an HR interview very <laughs> quickly. I know. Uh, <laughs> well, well, ease up after. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, th there were challenges literally every day. Um, yeah. So if I, if I take a step in the right direction, this year's car, the, the FW46, has challenged, it was presented to me that the amount of work, the, the technology change I asked the organization to do is approximately three years worth of work, but I gave them six months. It, it's a huge challenge. And what I've said all the way through is if we break it, we break it. As in we break the systems, methods, whatever it may be, do it. But what I don't want to do is be um, falling by the wayside or behind on the technology curve in 25, 26, 27. Let's take this opportunity now to reset, accept that we're not good enough in a number of areas, but we're intelligent individuals that all want the same thing and let's move together together. Let's move together in the right direction as, as one. And so <clears throat> the challenge of doing that really did push us as an organization to the absolute limit. Everything is um, on the later side of where you'd be comfortable. And through all of that, you have to hold a steady, a steady ship really and just make sure we're pushing in the right direction all together at the same time. Um, <clears throat> I think it was described uh, after the chassis was made as the most complex chassis that pretty much anyone had ever seen um, to give you an idea behind it. That's one element of it. So. Um, that's a challenge. It's a challenge because through rough waters, you've got to keep everyone sailing in, in the right direction. And for clarity, it's not where I want us to be as an organization. I want us to be well and truly ahead of the curve and pushing the boundaries of technology. Um, what's clear in it though, is when you challenge an organization, you gain at the back end of it, huge amounts of confidence that we're on the right pathway together. And what I mean by that is the organization didn't lay down or say, we can't do that. It stood up to the challenge and said, okay, let's do it. Um, now it's the start of our journey. It's just the very start of it all, but it's a great, great direction to be seeing. And it, it happened through the update that we did last year. So <clears throat> it's a very similar example, but the, the update that took place in Montreal, yep. um, just, uh, I think it was 10 days prior to that, that wasn't gonna happen. Um, and I had, a, um, had Fred here, our COO, yep. brought together probably around about circa 100 people downstairs into the um, race bays and said, we're going to do this. This is what we're going to achieve together, and this is why we're going to achieve it together at the same time. Within 10 days. It, it's, in the end, what happened is it was finished a day and a half early. Originally <laughs> believed to be, to be finished late. Yeah. And it's just really demonstrating to the organization that even, even they don't know what their capability is in the hardest of moments, and it's impressive what was achieved. By the way, a day and a half early, and it wasn't a sweat. It was, it was good. That's... And it, the challenge there is, again, pushing an organization to new limits that it's not aware of where those limits are. Uh, and I'm not aware of those where those limits are either. So 
but it felt great. I mean, part of the part of the speech really contained that we will score points in in Montreal. It was as direct as that. It, it wasn't anything more than we can do this. We're lining up all our stars to be there, and this is the start of our challenge back to the uh, back to the front. Hmm. And is there a year that you've circled for the team? Because you know, I know I come from the world of tech. I run a tech startup. You know, one of the things every company is thinking about is profitability mm. in that world. And you circle a date. You know, you tell everyone this is the month, this is the year. We're aiming for that. Is there something like that for you to tell people like this is when we come back to the top step? No, and and it's purposely so. Um, what I've seen all too often is those those targets are far too early, and what happens is you shortcut everything to get there. I don't want a single shortcut in this organization. I want everything that we're putting in place to be long term strategic solutions, which by the way, may cost us short term. Yeah. I'm okay with that. Because I want an entity that is the giant that it is back at the front fighting for, for wins and championships. And you can't get there by putting a sticky plaster on it. It m might even work for a year. It might even look good externally, but it will break the organization in time. And <clears throat> all too often, the reason why you don't do that is you, you yourself, I myself, would be at risk. Because you have to deliver at some point. But I'm also confident enough that we're doing enough change that we can start delivering performance step on step whilst doing the long term uh, requirements of what's what's needed. So to answer your question, no. What I am doing, though, however, is there is clear changes in culture, um, people, values, behaviors, all the items that are perhaps a little bit frilly, but are really important to me uh, because they define the people and the culture of this organization, which it's the powerhouse. It's not the machines you see downstairs, it's, it's the people and the ideas that they generate. And what I have done is put on there, these are the steps I want to be making every year as an organization. That includes how we communicate, how we work together, how we store data, how we input technology stacks. Those are tangible items that we can put numbers to and targets to. And when you move those forwards, the performance is just a second order that comes out the back end of it. So that's well really, said. Yeah, very well said. Now, reflecting on um, Albon's year, uh, he was actually one of my favorite drivers last season. I actually w was one. Was, actually, <laughs> oh, I, no. might have, I might have even said he was the driver of the year, yeah. right. in my opinion. Okay. And I have it's clips the to prove though. it. If he was here right now, he would be livid. He is <laughs> no. your favorite driver. No, he is my there favorite we go. driver. That's it. That's he was the driver of the year. He definitely um, I think he had a very impressive uh, qualifying sessions and some races where he scored points um where do you, where do you see Albon's future within Williams and his development it, it's um so first and foremost I've had the pleasure of knowing him since uh, we, we were trying to remember this but I think it was 2016 when I started working to him with him for the first time he was in the Mercedes simulator yes. and um uh he hasn't changed much in a good way <laughs> when Alex started with me at the beginning of the year he was um he was okay the Alex you had at the end of the year, I think, was a much, much stronger entity than at the beginning. He has confidence in himself and the team and what's going on and in me. Um, and he and I beat a, built a very strong relationship and that's carrying on. I've already been public and, and mentioning this. Um, my intention, and for that matter, his intention is to form this into a long-term relationship about how we move back towards the front together. Now, the, the, the obvious way of cementing that is bringing that forward in some sort of written form. But at the moment, what I can tell you is the direction that we're both going down is one where we want this relationship to last for a long time. And then on the other hand, obviously, you know, and this is, by the way, a thank you from longtime F1 fans for re-signing Logan. Because I think too many times in F1, you know, rookies come in and they're just expected to perform, you know, within their first season right away. Great. Without, if you look at other sports like basketball with the NBA, you know, you have players like Giannis, for example, that put up numbers for sure in their first year, but then their second, third, fourth year is where you see that dramatic progression. Um, in terms of Logan, though, how do you will and like will him on? How do you work with someone going into their second season where in the first season, perhaps they weren't you know, meeting their potential fully? So, so let's start with the first bit you brought up, rookie driver. So um, we threw him in the deep end, no doubt about it. Normally, what you would have done, if I take an example of another rookie on the grid, Oscar Piastri, he, he did circa 10, 11,000 kilometers of testing in an F1 car. Um, with Logan, we gave him a, a day and a half in Bahrain and, and said, good luck to you. Um, <laughs> <Run along. laughs> and, and as I said, all the way through the season, what I'm looking for for him is continued progress on where he is. Now, what, what happened actually is at the very beginning of the year, Bahrain and Saudi, Alex wasn't quite um, perhaps delivering the same level of performance you, you saw later. As I said, he evolved massively. And Logan was close. He did a lap even in qualifying in Saudi that was deleted, um, mm -hmm. but it was faster. And so what happened is straight away he thought, I've got this, we're in a good place. And um, 
it took quite a while quite a while with me to work with him to go let, let's build this up slowly my expectation on you by the way is that I'm not worried about what the performance gap is. What I'm worried about is the continuous evolution of what you're doing, your thought process, how you race, how you patternize things, how you work with the team. It's a package because it's a long-term relationship that we need to build again to that matter, not you're good at one race. Um, that doesn't serve you well and doesn't serve anything well. The pressure on his shoulders, uh, you brought it up there. It was enormous in the middle of the year. If you look what the world was really saying, not just to him, but to, I would say all rookie drivers at some point, it's enormous pressure. You're asking elite athletes that have transformed their life and have made it to the pinnacle of motorsport to then receive minute after minute, basically commentary about how they, they aren't at the sufficient level. At one point you question yourself and the resilience and strength you need to pull yourself through that and understand, no, I have what it takes to be the best in the world and I will do what it takes to be the best in the world and amongst the best in the world is enormous. And he has that and, and it's worth thinking that through. And that transition towards actually his performance at the end of the year was, uh, I already said this fairly publicly, but the car specs weren't the same between the two. We weren't um, able to produce the same car specs between the two. End of the year, we were back there and his performance was again, back to a level where um, it's strong and, and pushing on against, uh, as you said, Alex voted perhaps one of the best drivers of the year. It gives you a good benchmark to work from. And for that matter, Alex is also, and was also really good at working with him and giving him an environment where he can grow and that, that couldn't be said perhaps for a number of teams up and down the grid. We'd now went to the second year, exactly as you said, there's been a lot of change over the winter. I mean, he himself, if you interview him now, you'll find he's a stronger individual with a lot more confidence behind him. He's going to tracks that he now knows. There's some exceptions to that. Hasn't seen Shanghai, but yeah. for that matter, a lot of tracks, a lot of drivers haven't seen Shanghai, but for the most part, he has a good understanding now of A, the pressures involved, what's required on it, how to get into a rhythm, how to train across the winter, where his weaknesses are, where his strengths are, how do you keep fixing those and building those? And as a result, you have a confident human being that has foundations that they can push against now that they didn't have before. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited for this season for both drivers. For both drivers, yeah. yeah. And especially for someone like Logan, like you said, who now going into the off season, he can work on those weaknesses that he's identified. Correct. Which, you know, he couldn't probably say the same thing last year. And better year. chemistry within the team and his, his he, in, exactly the entire, right. uh, the, just yeah. the crew. Yeah. No one performs at their limit if you have any nervousness about whether or not you deserve to be there. Yep. And, and you'll see that's the confidence step that appears. I bet we could say the same thing about, about us. About us, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> We're coming into our second season here, you know. Yeah. I'm just saying, what We're are you working, working on? No, kidding. <laughs> this is now a real HR. <laughs> I mean, I think that's a pretty good Q1 there. I think so. Yeah? What are you going to give that as a color? Solid green. Solid green, not yeah. a purple. Yeah, that's now twice. That's two strikes. <laughs> that's typically Swish who does the offending of our guests. Oh, no, I'm in the good books right now. Today, yeah. I'm, I'm taking the heat for him because he often takes the heat okay. for us. So. Understood. But I love it. We'll work toward purple. We're wow. working towards okay. purple. <laughs> Q2 coming up very soon. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. I said it last time, I will continue to say it. This is one of our favorite partnerships and I'm just really excited to continue sharing this knowledge. I've been using BetterHelp since 2021. It's been quite a lot of time, a long time. Uh, long time. I was quite anxious in the latter half of the year in 2021 and yeah. decided to get on to BetterHelp because I frankly found an in-person therapist to be quite intimidating. Yeah. And also the fact that you have to take so much more of your day out to commute to a therapist and then come back. Yep. It was way easier going through BetterHelp. You know, you go through the form, fill out some details, you yeah. get matched to a therapist. Even if you don't like your therapist, you can change it for free. And that, they'll that's really, handy. really, really respect your feedback on yeah. that. Yeah, I really like, I, I love that feature. Uh, so whether you're like James Valls, who's managing a, an, an F1 team, very high pressure environment, or like myself, and swish day-to-day -day life anxiety or just uh trying to manage your social battery therapy can be a massive help find your social sweet spot with better help visit betterhelp.com track limits today to get 10 percent off your first month that is better help h-e-l-p.com slash track limits welcome back to the track limits podcast fevin we have given james a green now, he has some work that he needs to do in Q2 to get a purple. <laughs> He's like, I'm busy, man. <laughs> I'm tired. I am so sorry, but we're out of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Get out. And that yeah, is yeah. it. <laughs> but honestly, in Q2, James, we want to you know, bring you back to your childhood. And I'm genuinely curious, as a kid, was motorsport a huge thing for you? Was it always coming on during the weekends? Or were you interested in something totally different and then fell into it later in life? <clears throat> 
Um, so, so first and foremost, it's sort of featured as a part of my life, um, watching it on TV, watching the sport on TV. I wasn't watching football or anything else. Formula One was was really the main activity. Um, I I enjoyed like anyone um, karting in vehicles. So <clears throat> I grew up in Switzerland. The first the first time you can drive a vehicle is sixteen, and I was. It was a motorbike. First mm. thing I had um, to to pass your driving license. There you can't take the courses required. Certain courses required until you're eighteen. Then you go to a three or three exam. Then then a practical exam, and you have to do first aid at the same time. And typically. It would take several months to get this all out of the way. Seven days after my birthday, I'd pass my test. <laughs> oh, wow. it, it, it's, it was just dedication. Um, this is what I want. This is when I go get it. It just, the same way the first time you had a bicycle and you had the ability to explore outside the boundaries of a kilometre, you're now yeah. going five, six kilometres, seven kilometres away. A, a motorbike and then the car was an extension of that for me. And there was obviously a, uh, an amount of speed and power and control. So I had an attachment to that very early on. Um, but you don't think it's going to be a professional career when you're 14, 16, even 18. You see it on TV, but you don't realize that that's the tip of the iceberg. Um, and in fact, this is why Netflix, I think, has been brilliant, because you can see behind the scenes, there's a thousand people giving you everything to get those cars out. Um, so I didn't think it was a professional career uh, and, and sort of not left it be, but followed it as a sport um, in a light way. And um, you know, I sort of very much grew up in, in watching it in the early 90s and late 90s. So that's the whole, in fact, where we are today really around us. This this resonates a lot with me. And I remember one of the first times that I, I traveled to the UK, um, I sort of, uh, in the later part of my, my childhood, grew up with, with someone that um, he had troubles in his family. Unfortunately, his father passed away. And, and we sort of fell together and lived in the same home for a period of time. Uh, best way to explain it. But we traveled to the UK when we were 18, went to Silverstone, off, off chance, we had no idea what's going on. And I remember being at the gates, watching a Williams testing and going around. And just th these memories will stick in your mind forever. Yeah. Um, but it also tells you that whilst I didn't know what the direction of travel was, I had an inkling that this was an incredible sport. And if I can be a part of it in any way, shape or form, great. Um, I finished up all my, my education in, in Geneva, Switzerland, then came to the UK to do university. And, and it was a close choice. It could have been in Switzerland, which is where my, my what I would call my brother, but he, he's not really. We're, we're just very close friends that live together. Um, he remained there. I, I came here. And I came here because um, this is where I was born. I wanted to come back to the, to the origins of things. Again, it's not founded around motorsport. Um, and I didn't know what to do or study. So I studied mathematics and computer science. And for no other reason than I was good at them. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're in the 90s now, so actually these are two subject areas that will give you potential to do any job you want, near enough in that in that remit. Um, and about a year in, it was it was about a year in. Uh, I thought I really can't do this for 50 years. <laughs> this is this is uh, this is not for me. Um, so I applied. Uh, I actually checked this fact up last night um, because I. I couldn't remember, but I did check it last night. There were 11 teams. So I applied to 11 teams at the time, uh, found their addresses online, wrote a letter. And the letter wasn't one of, give me a job. Um, it was one of, here's who I am, here's what I do. I know I don't have what it takes to go there, but help me. I will transform my life to come and join you. Tell me what I need to do. And for the most part, it, I mean, this is back in the days where you still got letters, real, you know, yeah. real thick, lovely letters. What are those? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you have to like put a stamp on it. Exactly, all that sort of thing. Yeah, the, the, all that. I mean, this is back in the days where if you want an internet, it would make a lot of um, sounds at you for a period of time before you connected. Um, and all of them were rejections. But there were two very helpful replies. One was from a company called at the time British American Racing. One was from Williams. Both were constructive in... We don't need you now today. In fact, we, we don't take on mathematicians, we take mm. on engineers. And we don't take on graduates really. But what you gotta do first and foremost is bolster the amount of engineering knowledge and understanding you have. Um, and, and it was a life change, literally um, that day. I remember going, right, done. This is this is the direction I travel. So um, I started, uh, Snetterton wasn't far from the first university I went to. It's a, it's a racetrack in the UK, it's cold and windy and horrible, <laughs> but um, Went down there, literally just, just traveled down there, found teams at the time. It was a, a British GT team and a Formula, I can't remember if it's Formula 4 or Formula 3, mm -hmm. uh, and just offered, I'll do anything for you. Not a problem. I just want to learn fundamentally. And I was annoying enough that they, they allowed yeah, yeah. me to, to join them and work with them. And I made some awful mistakes. I still remember one today. It was a GT car where I, I pulled the air hose out too early and uh, no. dropped it on the ground at the wrong time. And there's all sorts of things that are just <laughs> foolish mistakes <laughs> in hindsight. But... 
irrespective, um, I guess did did my apprenticeship in the way you need to. Still studying at university, and then t- went to Cranfield University and did a motorsport engineering degree, um, which is um, first of its kind, it, it, certainly within Cranfield. Cranfield's a great university. Um, I was the only person without any engineering background there, so I had to really run to catch up with others. Um, really clever class, great class. Still, huge amounts of them friends today, um, which is which is always, in my opinion, the accolade of a good group of individuals. Um, Still at this point, though, dream to be in Formula One, but it's a dream. Um, and, and I realize, in fact, more and more just how difficult it's going to be to get there. Um, went on to um, initially become a race engineer in a Formula Three team. Then actually, um, we had two divergent projects. We, we started racing the same team in Le Mans at the same time. So they went off and did uh, the, the, um, the sort of sports car series. I ran as such at the time, the, F, the F3 team. They gave me a checkbook and very trusting individual called Ray Rowan um, could see potential in me. I think that's it, or he was just very foolish, but either way. <laughs> um, so I ran the Formula 3 entity and then did Le Mans racing that year as well with the team. Brilliant, brilliant experience. And sort of engrossed myself into, this is what I want to do. Not, not Le Mans, not Formula 3. I want to do Formula 1, but this is the way forward. Um, as a part of the university degree, um, we had to do a, a project whereby we designed a school race car um, for, for a company called Jim Russell Racing School, which doesn't exist anymore. In fact, what happened is um, we, we presented, uh, it was to an audience, inside the audience, not to my knowledge, but there were two F1 teams, um, and I received a job offer the next day. We also won, and, and I thought, this is brilliant. I was so in debt at the time. Oh, I thought, wow. this is great. I'm going to make some, some money. Uh, that company went bankrupt two weeks no. later. So, yeah, so um, funny, funny story. Nothing to do with the car design, I think. Yeah, yeah I hope. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it, it's sort of those... Uh, I guess everything happens for a reason. At the back end of it, it didn't matter. I had my way into Formula One, and, yeah. and a job was created for me. Um, so back then, Formula One teams were, if I take the case of British American Racing, which is where I started, 250 people. So you didn't do one job. You did everything, okay. everything you could. And um, uh, sort of formed my way, worked my way up um, through that organization. And, and British American Racing turned into Honda. Honda turned into Born GP. Born GP turned into Mercedes. And you can see... You look back at it, you can see the growth that the team had across that period of time. And it was all of it. Some of it, I'm not going to say fun, that's the wrong word, but it was, it was, um, it developed me into who I am today. And I was fortunate enough to be alongside a number of brilliant um, engineers in their own right. And uh, it, sort of the band of us grouped together and became, I guess, from, from young adults into serious men that that uh, and women that, that went on to develop what we have today in terms of the the history that was born gp and mercedes gp did you see the documentary by the way yeah yeah i i, I um so i was watching it around las vegas time actually i, I wasn't sleeping a lot in las vegas yeah. um, but, <laughs> no one was. <laughs> but uh did two episodes then did the x to the next day it's just it's addictive so it's hard not to and and i think they, the documentary was done very well it's a very accurate portrayal of what happened at that period of time there's a gazillion stories we could take up uh, your year's worth of podcast with all the stories yeah. that happened that year um it's a great part of my life i'll never forget it hardest hardest um certainly never in that region by a long long way but it was a great part of my life i mean that leads me to my next question like what motivated the move after t- almost you know two decades um and the, this move to williams a couple of things i don't i I was fortunate in as much as um, Toto gave me the ability to grow more and more within the role that I was there. I, I've had a, um, let's call it a trait or a habit since I've started in the sport, which is if there's a difficult or complex problem, I'll take it, I'll do it. Um, and it's got me to where I am today. I, I firmly believe it's the right way of doing things. Don't don't walk away from when things get difficult. In fact, push into it and show the world you can do it and more. Um, and uh, Toto could see that that aspect in me. He and I formed a really close relationship. I, I, I mean, he's a friend. Um, and he gave me the opportunity to grow more and more. So uh, drivers started to fall underneath me, then some tactical elements of motorsport, Formula E, GT3 racing, a bunch of other bits and bobs like that. With very clearly, he and I had, had honest chats about it. I, I was forming to be a team principal. That didn't mean within Mercedes, but... Um, as he became more and more successful, the job became more and more difficult. He was carving off elements to provide to myself, and not just to myself, to other members of his core uh, senior leadership team. And um, <clears throat> it got to the point where um, Toto, I still rate as one of the best, if not the best in the sport. And it, he should be there for many more years. But the result of that is that I have to form my own pathway. 
and um i i also believe in in not coincidences but everything comes together at the right time and spoke to to williams actually in the winter of uh 22 and the synergy was enormous more than i had anticipated so if we wind wind back a little bit there's a relationship with williams because there is uh, a relationship between mercedes and williams not yep. just the power unit but a supply of componentry as well so as the result of that i knew the senior management here knew the board here and knew uh, really dalton as, as investors and liked what they stood for but they're serious about going back towards the front what happened though in the winter sort of of 22 is we just held uh, and it really was just one initial phone conversation and then a pretty serious meeting and then both sides out the back end of that went this this can work let's make it happen and it was days um before we really got to to a, a completion of that um and for me it was the following it has we built a lot of history at mercedes williams has more we within mercedes you would be fine-tuning minor details because that's what it is it's a very fine-tuned uh, racing organization here and this suits me far more. You dig down to the foundations and you bring an entity up, a giant back up again. And and by the way, the way I treat this is for 25 years, Formula One has been great to me. Um, it really has. It's looked after me. It's hard at times, but it's looked after me. This is my opportunity as well to leave my, my fingerprint, my DNA on the sport as an organization as great as Williams. This will come across once. Yep. Once that someone wants to invest to bring this back to the forefront. Once that you have a team that with this amount of accolade and history that has been on its feet for on its knees, sorry, for a period of time that wants to get back up and fight for the best. And you can't turn that down. No, definitely not. I agree. And you strike me as someone who's incredibly confident. Um, do you ever get imposter syndrome? Do you oh, ever feel like, you know, I'm not equipped for this the, job? The whole time. And um, <clears throat> it, it goes back to what I said to you before. You have to remind yourself always, it's not about one individual. It's about the thousand people behind you. And um, that's the truth behind it. That's not imposter syndrome. That's the reality behind it. The imposter syndrome bit is that um, it, it, we are fortunate here. We had a good year last year. And I, and I think we're on the right pathway for having good years for the many years to come in front of us as well at the same time. As I said before, it's not one decision you make. It's about bringing the right people together at the right time to talk about it. And as long as you remember that, you're going to be fine. You'll keep your feet on the ground. You forget that, you'll float away. And so... You know, imposter syndrome was, was very much one one term applied to it. I'd put it more into just keep the facts as the items that you use as your guiding light. Um, this isn't because you're a special individual. I, I say it publicly time and time again. There are many more intelligent people than me in this organization. No doubt about it. Um, and that's how it should be. I'm going to take you back a little bit. Um, you just said you applied to... All the uh, all the F1 teams. You you talked us through kind of your journey to getting into F1. What advice in today's world, with you know where we have digital applications and LinkedIn and whatnot? <laughs> uh, but what advice would you give to someone who is looking and listening to your story and is going, "I want his job. I want to be in the world of F1." Like, what what would you say to that person? I I think the first and foremost is I've had the pleasure of of employing some of the the brightest graduates um, I've ever seen. I don't think I get on our own graduate program now. Um, <laughs> the um, What's brought them all together is exactly the same thing. First and foremost, they are the best, pretty much top two, if not the best, in their class. And that's what you need to be. This is the best of the best of the best. Best universities, top of your class. And not just that, you have not just the intelligence that goes with it, but the humility to understand where your weaknesses are and where your strengths are the drive that you know you're going to have to work your way up from the bottom all the way to the top and the journey could be the same as mine 20 years but you're ready to give it all up for that the passion that goes with it because in the hardest moments that's what drives you forwards the the want and desire to not communicate via just just message but but human contact which which we all too often lack in our lives today and and modern society is pushing us away from it but those are skills that if you have the right element of that you can fly. And then the final one is the ability to work either as a single individual or as a part of a team of a thousand people. And that at no point does your ego kick into it. It is all about those around you, not yourself. And that there's a lot of life skills in there that is really hard on someone that is 20, 25. You don't get the opportunity to learn them as much anymore. But what you're looking for is that complete package that brings it all together. And the answer to it is that, I mean, it, it, 
parents love me because I, it, it, it really does become a sales pitch for it. But yeah. you've got to be the best you can possibly be in your school and then through university. There's no such thing as, as too much work at that level. There really isn't. Um, and that's what will bring you here. It's not by writing a good letter. It's not by um, being even necessarily at the right place at the right time. Be the best you can be out of those around you. And now Formula One's different to what it was when I, 25 years ago when I started. We provide opportunity for about 40 graduates a year. But to get there, you've got to stand up. How many applicants is that? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a lot. It's thousands and thousands. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And you've got to stand out in amongst that crowd. And there's no easy way to it. There's no shortcut to it at all. But the ones, when you read a CV, it, even through a CV, you can see straight away it stands out. Um, there's those that, that don't want it as much as the others, and there's the ones that just want it with all their heart. And they go the extra mile, for sure. And it stands out. Final two questions of Q2 here. You've gone on record many times, I know, just looking at your past interviews, and you've talked about you know, what Toto has contributed to your career in terms of the lessons or, or kind of the teachings that he's given. I'm curious for the other leader in Mercedes, Lewis Hamilton, what you know you potentially extracted from him in terms of any lessons or, or anything you took away from that relationship. <clears throat> So I'll go into Lewis and answer that one, but it isn't just Lewis. Uh, I would say Nicky Lauda, Ross Braun, uh, David Richards. Uh, you'd be a fool if you didn't take everything out of everyone that you can at any stage that they provided to you. Um, the same thing, Michael Schumacher as well. Um, all the drivers I've ever worked with. Um, so with Lewis, he has a desire to win that will, by the way, every champion I've worked with have exactly the same sort of traits. His are, are very atoned and very skilled. He'll do what it takes either to his body, to himself, to his training, to his life, to win races. There's nothing that will stand in his way to get there. And it's that dedication that is enormous. Every millisecond matters. And what it does is it drives you forward to go, I don't want to let him down by being the one that holds back a millisecond or two of that. Every development matters. Every moment that he can extract the performance matters as well at the same time. And he brings you on that journey with him. Um, the next thing about him is that he's not... Engineers can be constrained often by what you believe to be correct. So you don't you don't push outside of those boundaries. He's not. He's constrained by, let's go and explore all of that again. And you never know what you might find. And that's often led, some of the biggest developments I remember actually on F1 cars, the innovations to a certain extent were accidents. You sort of went down a different direction and something happened. And um, he's very good at pushing engineers outside of comfort into new areas where you'll think, well, there's no point going there. There's nothing there. And all too often you find something. and. Again, I would say that's one of his skills. But the final one is, and, and I'm very privileged, and I know I'm very privileged, but I've spent, uh, he and I went, went motorbiking together lots on track. Uh, a lot of the time hidden, you wouldn't have known he was there. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I remember once, actually, we were having, having dinner together in a, in a restaurant in Spain, and we had to run. We had to run out of the restaurant because we were being chased by, <laughs> by about oh, a thousand no. people because someone cottoned <laughs> on that he was there. I think the mistake was he tried to pay with a hundred euro bill for, uh, uh, and that, that gave it away. That was but it, it's, um, my point to that is that I've had the privilege of knowing him as, as a human, as a friend. And he is a, a caring human who, think about it, how do you know who in your life to trust? Mm. Because you're Lewis Hamilton. And um, the fact that he, he opened that up for me to be alongside him as part of his life meant uh, a tremendous amount to me. And he's... He's an individual, I already told you, he'll change his life to be there. He goes back to an apartment by himself in Monaco and trains. Dedication to the absolute level of winning a championship. Yeah, hopefully this season or next season. Yeah, we'll <laughs> manifesting it. Yep, I'm, I'm rooting for him too. Um, one of the last questions, yep. I guess. You broke the internet when <laughs> you came when you created a, uh, your instagram um you broke the internet in the motorsport industry <laughs> <laughs> i mean it, there was there was a lot of it was on bbc what are you saying uh, yeah, yeah okay. it was a uh, breaking i'm news. trying to remember if i put something up i really regret now <laughs> <laughs> i feel like your heart skipped a beat there yeah, when no, I said, I feel, oh. broke the internet he's like dom if i don't say no, okay good all right we're fine um i guess what prompted you to create uh, your instagram um it because there's some there's another aspect of things that i can show you on on my life that that you won't get through through the main feed of things so yeah. um the main thing would always contain here's where we are here's what's about the sport but there's some always behind the scenes bits elements yeah. that i think um the same way netflix opened up the world and showed you actually this is a little bit more what it's like behind the scenes yeah. that's the intention behind it as well so I, it's a sport i love 
Um, I, I personally think that sharing what I love is the best thing that I can do with the world. And so that's, uh, that's the format behind it all. Love that. Purple? I've Oh yeah, absolutely. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. It, it doesn't matter. The first not. sector is still green. <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna do the lap again. Hey, hey, hey. We, so, we all know Q3 is where it counts. Yes. Yeah. Q3. We all know that. <laughs> as long as we don't <laughs> get another purple, we're fine. All right. James Valls through to Q2, through to Q3. Oh my <laughs> God. Q3 rapid fire round coming up shortly. <laughs> Welcome back to the final segment of the Track Limits podcast with James Vals. We're now getting into the rapid fire round. James, we're going to pepper you with a bunch of questions here. We'd love for your answers to be rapid and full of fire. Let's Understood. Go. <laughs> Perfect. What regulation change would you institute in F1 if you had to add anything? For example, double points on the last race. Oh, I know you said rapid fire, but there's so many to do here. Um... <laughs> <laughs> it, it's it's a it's a good question i don't have a problem with it it's yeah. a really good question what would i do um the direction of travel is the correct one um i would um so th the big thing that i've already started the drive on is cost cap's a great thing it's a good thing yeah. in fact go and look from 2017 to now you'll see the whole fields closing into each other mm -hmm. good the only thing that's there, I already spoke about it, we're down on facilities. They're 20 years out of date. The cost cap also, there's two sides to it, CapEx, capital expenditure, and OpEx. Keep the OpEx, don't change that. But on the, the CapEx side, I think that has to be scaled to allow those to catch up that can't at the moment because we want a sport where I yeah. can win. And yep. with the same equipment. <laughs> yep, love it. Uh, most unpopular opinion you have? Um, the the Q one should have been purple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you Damn, guys decide. He's never going to let me. Live you there. guys decide. <laughs> Racing memorabilia you would like to own or are super proud that you own. Uh, so I, so I collect drivers' helmets because they mean a tremendous amount to me. They they are. Um, it's an it's a very personal thing. It contains what has saved their life or could save their life. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm I'm fortunate. I have I have a few at home, uh, but. But one of the great um, champions that I never had the opportunity to get a Michael Schumacher one that that would mean the world to me because he was such a, a lovely human being and meant a lot to me in my life. Um, Zach Brown got a tattoo when Daniel Ricardo won his race. If Alex or Logan uh, win a race this year, what are you going to do? Definitely not a tattoo, as it turns <laughs> oh, out. Start it. Yeah, I know Zach fell for that. The winning a race. I mean, winning a race would be would be potent enough. I, so. Normally, I've refused everything. There was a load about, yeah, color your hair for your opponent. No, no, that, that's Alex. That's his thing. Let's not take that away from him. <laughs> but, but if I see the right suggestion that I go, okay, I can accept that. It's not permanent. It will make a fool out of me for a period of time. But if it's worth it for a win, I'd, I'd contribute to that. So maybe I'd like, say the other way around, put some suggestions in. Let's see what we can do. Maybe wear like a tie or like a funny colored, uh, I don't know, bow tie or something for every race. Yeah, you, you could do that. Yeah, you haven't seen me on the weekend. That might be what I do. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah, you know, your social media game. You need, yes, to, right, yeah. you need to show us what you do on Indeed. the weekend. I'm going to skip a few here. Uh, I don't know if you're plugged into internet culture too much in terms of memes, but just finish my sentence here, okay? All right. Valtteri, it's... James. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the um I, I tell you a great thing. I was walking around Monaco in twenty twenty I think it was twenty twenty, and there was a poster on the wall saying keep your distance. It was it was COVID time. Keep yeah. your distance, it's James. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, yeah, that's quite funny actually. Um cool. Um who's one driver in the junior categories or F uh, F two, F three that you've been very impressed with? Um a lot of them so um so obviously we have a tremendous amount on the Williams books as well. We have Zach who drove an FP1 and, and what impressed me, it, FD was, was strong, but what impressed me more was we gave him an opportunity in FP1 and he did a really solid job with it. So him and then Luke Browning in F3. Um, he's got, have spent time with you if you haven't, sparkle in his eye and he's got something really special. Um, but there's other moments where he knows, I already said it to him and I'll say it publicly, you don't really overtake around the outside of Beckett's and he tried to. <laughs> That's not a good move. So, um, Agreed. plus and minus. All right. Uh, last few here. What's your favorite guilty pleasure TV show? 
don't know if you watch a lot of TV, but there's not a tremendous amount of time for TV. My, mine is sort of exactly that. If I get into a good show, so I, I'll t tell you the best show in the world, Brooklyn Nine Nine. Whoever oh, created wow. that, well yeah. done to you. Um, so <laughs> wow. there you go. Andy uh, Samberg's yeah. legend. Andy's and <laughs> that sort of thing, you watch the whole lot and you haven't realized what's happening. You've just suddenly yeah. been there for for three hours. <laughs> so that would be my guilty pleasure. Great shows like that. Cool. If you had to choose another sport to be a team boss of, what would you be drawn to? Um, similar thing. It has to be something where you, you get tested every few weeks as to whether you're good enough or not. And the problem right. with football is that that doesn't really happen. You know whether you're good enough against one organization, not all of them. Mm. Um, but what I resonate with is, for example, America's Cup racing. I love it. It's the same thing. You're pushing the boundaries of technology and human performance. Um, so I, I really I feel connected with that. I feel connected with... Um, cycling as well. Again, mm. same thing. You you have these extreme athletes that will push themselves to the absolute limit and a team behind that. And it's a development technology. So that or probably something more vague, i.e. part of Olympics, because again, you're now having the, the opportunity to be surrounded by 100 athletes that are changing their life for one thing. Last two, you're stranded on an island. Which three drivers or team principals are going to be joining you on that island? Jesus, no. <laughs> I mean... There's, there's other people out there that are yeah. interesting as well. Um, okay. Um, Drivers-wise. Um, good question. Uh, let's go to team. It's, uh, it's mixed between the two. Let's have a think, actually. Team principles. You you want someone practical that's with you at the same time that, you know, can go out there and wrestle a shark, that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> you know, just, just putting it out there. <laughs> what island are we going to? Yeah. <laughs> and why are you wrestling a shark? I, I, would actually, I, I, I think I would take Toto. He's he's yeah. physically fit. He, he'd he be able to, I, I think he'd do pretty good. If there was a lion, I'd push him in front. We'll be all right. <laughs> there you go. Um, Driver-wise, so, some of them are really entertaining and and exciting and and brilliant to, to be with and work with. So uh, current, current or just anyone? Um, current. Um, so so I would take Alex. I'll tell you why. He he will keep me entertained for yeah. <laughs> so long. He is and it's natural with him. This yeah. isn't this isn't an act. That's yeah. how he is and it is brilliant. So that's that's now two of the three. And I think the second one would also be a driver. And um oh, I gotta think through who it is, because uh, they're all special. It it'd probably be Daniel Ricardo because yeah. again, uh he is really, really funny. And um th there's not a moment where he switches off. That's it, that's yeah. Daniel. So yeah. I, I think the entertainment value would be there. And then the food gathering we there with Toto. <laughs> exactly. Um, you're writing an autobiography on your life. Which of these titles resonate best with you? The Daredevil, the Dreamcatcher, the Free Spirit, the Hardest Worker, or the Calm and Cool Collected? I'd say Dreamcatcher, uh, because I'm I'm convinced that what you need is aspiration to drive you forward in life. And when you catch up to it, there's another one in front of you. So it, it resonates with me. That pole? Is that pole for that James? Is, that is absolutely that is pole. pole. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, James, for coming on. Guys, go and follow James. We're going to link his social media yes. below. Good. We're also going to link Williams. Thank you again for setting this up for us. Yes. This is a beautiful space to be in. If you enjoyed this episode, like, share, subscribe. We'll see you guys in the next episode. See yeah. ya.